I'm uh, I'm still kind of like pissed about the Warriors game last night. Like, it, it, it's I think it's not as much as like um, bitching about the refs, which I know a lot of Twitter was all over that. It's more like they gave up 20 turnovers, and like I think it was 14 of those turnovers led to points for the Lakers. That shit is like you cannot fucking do that in the playoff game. That pisses me off so much. We lost the game by three points. Like, and also. I mean, the technical foul against Draymond was bullshit, but, like, ugh. It's so frustrating. My eye! Yeah. I literally just, can't see. Did you see Steph's response when he said that at the end of the game? He's just like, whatever, man. He just, like, kind of, like, threw his hand up and just walked away. Like, Yeah. It, it's just, it, it, I will say it was disappointing, but it was kind of fun to go through the shenanigans of it all again. Dude, <laughs> After was, these last couple years, you know what I mean? That was so much fun. It was probably going to be i would say probably going to be the the best the funnest playoff game that might be the best game of the playoff year game at the end of it all yeah maybe i mean definitely i would probably i would argue that it's probably going to be the best playoff game but yeah it was it was insane at the end of the day you know we have to win t- tomorrow so that's that's the whole thing but at the end of the day i think i would rather play a jazz team without donovan mitchell than a a really good suns team right now though to be honest with you smoked him a few weeks ago yeah, but we, I mean, we beat the Suns too, but yeah, anyway. See, we're we're delaying the inevitable talk of the A's, even though this is an A's podcast, because uh, the series sucked mm-hmm. against Houston. Yeah, But you know what? At the end of the day, Bro. this is still a baseball podcast. So welcome to the town tailgate this week. Julio did the introduction, kind of. What's up? I'm you Julio. Introduction every once in a while, I feel like. Yeah, every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, I'm Julio, Julio. Chris, back at you again for another week of Oakland A's baseball talk. Um, let's jump right into it, Julio. The big three this week. Uh, <laughs> so we had two more no-hitters. No one cares, of course. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's just, it's like, it's so, I don't even know. I, I feel bad <laughs> not, like, caring more about these no-hitters, but... At the same time, like, this is just where the game's going because the morons over in New York running the league don't, like, know what they're doing. So it's, like, maybe it's good that I don't care because it's going to show them, like, whatever you're doing, it's not working. Uh, This, so to make sure we don't confuse anybody, there's four topics that we're actually talking about the big three this week, but these two are kind of tied in together because... Um, it, it feels like we're repeating this every other week and yeah, two no hitters happen. Uh, Spencer Turnbull from the Detroit Tigers. I was going to say Pistons and then, uh, Corey Kluber for the Yankees. He, he no hit the Seattle Mariners who, um, have in the last 57 games, the team as, as a whole is hitting one fifty one one ninety three as a whole. And- the last 57 games, that's what they're hitting. It's They're incredibly on the downhill. It's bad. And then uh, Corey Kluber no hit his former team, no, not Cleveland, Texas. Remember, <laughs> he was a Texas Ranger for yeah. like seven innings. Also, the same night as Corey Kluber bobblehead day at Texas because they still had all of his bobbleheads. That's from so last great. Year. That's so great. That's amazing. So out of the... The six, you know, six no hitters this season. Two have been against Cleveland. Two again have been against Seattle. Yeah, and two have been against Texas. Uh, even Clayton Kershaw, you know, he's thrown a no hitter. I think he's done a perfect game. I don't think so. I could be wrong. Even he's come out saying like, no hitters are great. I'm a pitcher. I love them. Mm-hmm. But if they're happening at this hyper frequency, this is a huge problem. Yeah. And like, uh, even though at the top, I like, you know, I made my pitch about how MLB is doing something wrong. At the end of the day, I don't even know if you can necessarily blame this on MLB. I mean, they took some of the (laughs) juice out of the balls and they're a lot more flat. But at the same time, like, especially a no hitter, I feel like that's more on the pitcher and just how all these pitchers are throwing gas, you know, like, I mean, just blowing by guys. I don't know. I would have to look up the average velocity of the no hitter pitchers that of the season. I don't know that. So maybe I'm talking out of my ass, but that's the immediate thought process where to where I go as an educated baseball fan, you know, that's the only thing I can think of. Well, I was going to say the quality of teams, but it's like, you know, 
Seattle has has, has been sure. competitive. They're starting to fall off, like you said. And then Still have some young uh, talent, though. Yeah, and Cleveland's playing pretty good ball this year. Uh, well, we're going to see. We've talked about this before, but when we get to the CBA agreement for the offseason, I think this can be like a very spicy topic. The rumors of pushing the mound back because that might make a difference. You got anything else before we move on? Because this is this again, this is going to take us some time. I, I don't want to get started on the mound shit because I'll go all day. I don't agree with that, but no, I'm good. Let's move on. <laughs> so I think before we start this too, um, we made a huge discovery this week. As you know, may know, Chris is, uh, I wouldn't say, for the lack of better words, anti-boomer. Until we just found out that our good friend, Tony LaRusso, was born in 1944. <laughs> and according to the definition of the term boomer, it's 1945. So he was born even before a boomer. <laughs> so I didn't even know that generation still lived. But I didn't. Know I mean, I mean, Paul the, McCartney. I didn't I know the same age. Yeah, I didn't know what the like birth cutoff yeah. was. Damn, he's that old. He's older than my dad. My dad's old as fuck. Anyway, yeah. uh, um, wow. Yeah, when you told me that, that was pretty funny. But yeah. uh, anyway, keep going. Yeah. So this is what happened this week. If you did not hear the news, the Chicago White Sox were visiting the Minnesota Twins. It was a complete blowout. At this time, I think it was like 14 to four. Mm. It was the bottom of the eighth uh, or, or top of the eighth, something like that. They had uh, La Tortuga, uh, Williams Estadio out there pitching. So a position player was out there pitching. Um, he was literally just throwing lollipops out there, 48 mile per hour stuff, whatever. Yeah. And then uh, he gets a, he has a 3 0 count going against Yerman Mercedes, the White Sox rookie. He's, he would carry the team. DH, he's been carrying the team for the first few weeks, and they're kind of struggling at the gate. Right. And homeboy just took it deep, straight to center field. Well, uh, Tony LaRusa did not like that. Here are some quotes from the man himself. Big mistake, the fact that he's rookie and excited helps explain why he was clueless, but now he's got a clue. Took several steps from the dugout onto the field, yelling, take, take, take. The way he was set up, it looked to me he was going to swing. I was upset because not I was upset because that's not a time to swing 3-0. I knew the twins. I knew the twins knew I was upset. He missed a 3-0 take sign with that kind of lead, that sportsmanship and respect of your own opponent. So the following day, uh, obviously this blew up. Yerman more or less came out. I was like, hey, I'm not going to change who I am, which don't. That's mm-hmm. tight. Good for you. Uh, well, the following day, the they played again against each other, and <laughs> excuse me, Tyler Duffy, no relation to Dan Duffy, I think. Uh, he was a reliever for the Twins. Uh, he threw behind. Um, he threw behind Yerman Mercedes. He gets tossed, and now he got suspended for two games. And Tony, throw, I thought he hit him. He didn't hit him. Uh, he didn't hit him. He missed. Oh. He threw behind him. Interesting. Um. But then he pretty much came out and was just like, you know, whatever's going to come to him, he, he more or less kind of, I don't know, that's off quote, but he's, he kind of deserves what's coming to him. Yeah. Fuck that. Wow. If my manager didn't like back me up, like I'd be so fucking pissed. I mean, they already kind of had issues with him coming into the season. Like I think Tim Anderson had said some things about that when the hire happened, but like, dude, you gotta, you gotta have. Okay, anyway, sorry, keep going. But you gotta. Oh, have exactly. Your, sorry, your I got the exact, back, bro. You gotta have your I got, bag. I got the exact quote. Said I don't have a problem with how the twins handled it. All right, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I. It's just. I mean, I don't have a problem with how the twins handled it. Like, get the fuck out of here, you old fuck. Like, do you, like you. I just. Oh, uh, oh my god! It just the <laughs> amount of just disrespect that this dude constantly has towards like, just regular life it's just insane i i i don't i i I didn't support it in the beginning look it's all great that he won a world series in 1989 off the shoulders of steroids um cool Uh, and uh allegedly okay yeah allegedly Uh, allegedly 
Allegedly, but, allegedly. I mean, I there's never really been a soft spot in my heart for this guy. I didn't grow up with teams <laughs> managed by him, so it's like maybe it's just lost on me a little bit. There's no there's no love lost there. Um that it yeah that's ridiculous i mean yeah. i i understand you have to address it in the post game so that's fine go ahead and, and and address it and and say your piece that you didn't agree with it but don't like completely throw him under the bus like say something like you know he's a kid he's learning like you know we're working through it um wasn't crazy about his decision but um you know it's something that he'll learn and we'll teach him and you know it's part of the growing process like that's probably the best way to go about it not just being like I don't, you know, I'm okay with how they handle it. You know, they fucked up. I don't know. Whatever. That's bullshit. Anyway, go ahead. Uh, another quote we got is from Lance Lynn, uh, the ace uh, right now, of the White Sox. Yeah. Said, when the position player is out there, there's no rules, man. He's like, the more I play this game, the more those unreal rules have gone away. Yeah. Totally remark. Totally the Russo's remarks. Lance has a locker. I have an office. I don't agree. <laughs> Big mad. Big mad. Uh, oh, Tim Anderson God. came out and supported him. He's like, yo, keep swinging, baby. That's mm. what you do. And that's what it comes down to, man. Look, unwritten rules, whatever. D- 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 I don't care. Mm-hmm. This is a 28-year-old rookie who's yeah. been a career minor leaguer. He's finally getting his chance. He's going to be, I think he's going to be a free agent at the end of the season, or he has some sort of an arbitration coming at the end of the season. Do whatever you can to build up those numbers. So when you go on, if you want to go get a contract, like, yo, this is what I got. Mm-hmm. Like, this is what I had going for the season. And now you have a manager who's kind of going to punish you supposedly. And Bill Russo has been kind of an idiot with him a lot of the season too. Um, he is, he came up as a catcher, but Larissa doesn't believe in him as enough as a catcher to kind of play there. Mm-hmm. But the thing is, if somebody's hitting the swell as he has throughout the season, you're going to find a way to get this guy at least somewhat decent somewhere in the field so you can play him no matter what, especially yeah. in these National League games. Yeah. It's just so, it's just so like, egregious. It's just so gross that this guy, like, La Russa is just so out of touch, realizing, like, at the end of this day, like, this guy might not be able to, this guy not, might be playing for a lot longer. The game is we don't just know. so, it's just so past him, you know? Like, the game is just so moved past him, and he just so out of touch. And it, it's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know what it, it's going to take to, to get him out of the game, but like, it's just like, it's clearly evident, like for the first two months of his managerial career with the, with this team that he's just so out of touch with what's going on in this game. And he's part of the problem. You know, he's part of the problem with baseball is like, they keep bringing guys like that back and being like, it's going to help the game. Like we get these old legends back. It's like, do you think a 12 year old watching baseball gives two flying fucks on who, who Tony La Russa is? No, they have no idea who that is. Like, I don't know. I mean, you want to get a younger audience and you got to get people like this out. I want to, I want to ask you this historically throughout, let's say this last 20 years. Cause we've seen this, not just in baseball, it's happened to football. It's happening to our team right now in football. Really? Yeah. It's happened in basketball. How many times have those coaches, those managers who took a huge gap, decided they're going to come back. Mm -hmm. How many of them have been successful? The only person I can think of is Larry Brown. But also that Pistons team was like, you know, shout out to Ben Wallace getting to the Hall of Fame this year. That Pistons team was like a whole other level. Like, I can't think of any other. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Larry Brown was an extremely successful coach for Kansas in the late 80s, early 90s. And then he went to the the Pacers and he led them to – an Easter conference finals, like three, like three times. Oh, yeah, my um, bad, my bad. I thought yeah. he took a longer break. No, no. my mistake, At, but pretty much after the Pistons, he <laughs> kind of fell off, but no, he was a pretty successful coach for like 20 years. Or think of like Joe Gibbs. Remember he retired yeah. and he came back yeah. 12 years later and was just kind of washed, you Dude, know, off the top of my head. Yeah. That's a tough one. This, it never worked. It rarely works out when you kind of take, you know, let's see what happens with Dusty Baker. But even still, Dusty's like been managing in this last decade in multiple teams. Yeah. Oh, man. I'd really have to think on that. Do you see this team just pretty much pulling a few mutiny, being like, we're not going to listen to you? 
Um, we're just going to play the way we're going to play because it's working. And as been, they've been light. They've been pretty killer to start now since after kind of a sluggish start. They're in first in American League Central, I think. Um, looking up the record have too now. much talent, man. It kind of yeah, sounds like too talented. They're, they're, that's what they're doing now. It kind of sounds like that literally like with Tim Anderson going and supporting his player and, and, and all these, and you know, Lance Lynn and all these guys, like kind of sounds like it's already happening and they're yeah, just they like, have the, they it. Have we're going to win record. it. We're going to win it without you. They have the best record in the American league. Yeah. But, so, but that's just cause they have so much fucking talent, you know? Yeah. Like if they had a legit manager, they'd be dominating the American. League. Uh, over under last thing. And then we'll move on mm. over under three weeks until we talk about him again. We talk about Larusa. Uh, Actually, under, two and a half. Two and a half. Under. You're oh. gonna say it's gonna be able to talk about him again for some reason. Yeah, I, I maybe over two and a half, maybe over. No, under. I'll take the under. Unders. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I'll have to write that down somewhere. Now, this this last week in baseball was kind of weird. Um, yeah. There wasn't a ton of stuff going on, but this was kind of a weird thing that. Is just real inconvenience. The, the Minnesota Twins, we just talked about them. Mm-hmm. Uh, they are currently the worst team in the American League, which is bizarre because they've been one of the best teams consistently these last few years. And what, what's not helping is what they've just had to go through. Uh, as we you record, argue, there's, their best player is hurt. Yeah, Byron Buxton was off to like yeah. insane star, got hurt. Yeah. Um, as we're recording this uh, Thursday night, they had a game in Chicago on Wednesday. Mm. They flew to Anaheim and had a double header to make up for a COVID skipped game. Mm-hmm. And then they're flying to Cleveland tomorrow to have a three game series against Cleveland. Yeah. It's just a total clusterfuck because they, because they the COVID shit. Like it's just, I, I don't know. I mean, I understand you have to fit these games in somewhere. And because, you know, they had the postponement to the angels who aren't in their division. So it's not like necessarily a, um, uh, a common, series that, that that's going to happen again where you can fit it in there so you have to do it somewhere but why wouldn't you fit it in with a west coast road trip like that's what doesn't make sense to me like at least somewhat of a west coast road trip like like you're gonna have them fly across the country in three days like that just sounds ex- that's just fucking stupid it's just dumb like <laughs> just this very stupid part on on major league baseball front office or just have them take advantage of the all-star break and maybe have them start up a day early or something like that, or a day later. Yeah. That's not a good, but, that's not a bad idea either. Or like, yeah, just doing a West coast road trip. And then like they, the twins were just in Oakland. What two weeks last week, two weeks ago, or, or you, or you, they should have planned the schedule before the season, like maybe gave it given like four days at the end of the season for makeup games, like knowing that there is a possibility with COVID going on that we could have multiple teams with postponed games. So let's like delay the playoffs for like three or four days and then we'll, we'll make up these games. Like that probably would have been a smarter move too. It, I don't know. They don't think, you know, I, you kind of bring up another a point with this and it's that, uh, the MLB scheduling just seems really weird this year. Yeah. If was. you, because like after we're, we're going to talk a little bit more in, in our segment coming up, but if you look at the A schedule, they've played every team in the American League Geeks except for the Yankees. Mm-hmm. And the only American League West team they've played this whole time has been Houston. And they've played Houston three different times. Yeah. And it's the end of May or, you know, almost the end of May. We, we're going to get the Angels this weekend, but still like, how did that happen? Usually you want to get those, especially I thought they were going to be a little more restrictive about how far they're going to having teams travel still right now. Um, it just doesn't make sense. I don't, I, I know it used to be like this old couple. They used to do like the MLB schedules. They would make them out. And I think now that's just all like a, a count a arithmetic thing that did use it. Just doesn't make sense. Stupid. Yeah. I don't I don't know enough about the schedule making process to make an educated guess on that, but it it definitely feels like it doesn't make much sense for us this year. And like, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to look up the Astro schedule um, because it's going to be important later on uh, when we talk about that. But yeah, I don't yeah, I don't know. I don't I mean, just playing one team in our division in the first two months of the league or the season makes no sense. Yeah. 
which yeah. again we'll get into that more in depth uh, after this. Um, moving on. Uh, we want to talk about the Giants here because the Giants are. I don't know what is going on with the Giants. They it, they are literally like an island of misfit toys. So they have the best record in all of baseball at twenty eight and sixteen. They are a game up on the on the Padres. They are two and a half games up on the Dodgers in the in the NL West, which is arguably I would make the argument the best division in all of baseball. Their star player who you can argue is a star, but their best player, Mike Yastrzemski, has been hurt. Uh, he just got back, and their run differential is plus 57. Plus 57. That's a thing. Um, I mean, they scored 19 runs today against, against, the, uh, against the Reds, which I watched on YouTube, which was kind of fun. I, I don't – I mean, and the funny thing about it is they're trotting out the same crew. It's Brandon Belt. It's Buster Posey. It's Brandon Crawford. Brandon Crawford's having like the season of his life right now with 10 home runs. It's main. He leads all shortstops and home runs right now. Yeah. I mean, but I'm going to warn everybody now listening to this podcast. This is not sustainable. If you look at the talent on their team, I'm telling you right now, you, I'm sure Giants fan will disagree with me, but Giants fans don't know anything about baseball. They're bandwagon fans. <laughs> I had to get my jab in there. Um, it's not going to be sustainable. Um, I hope that they make the playoffs because I like watching them play baseball, but it's, yeah, I mean, it's weird. It's really weird. Um, to counteract that, I think there's some things that are sustainable. Um, it's been awesome, 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 awesome to see Buster hitting again. Having him being healthy and having him actually performing again. Um, I don't have a Sitting out last season was probably very Sitting. helpful to him. But Buster is like, back it's been so much fun he's like yeah for the for the last 10 years you know i'm a big giant tater but he's still been like one of my favorite players throughout that time yeah, it's been fantastic sure. seeing him out there uh the rotation is killer mm-hmm. you're talking about like the island of misfit toys that's their whole rotation alex yeah. wood was an all-star a few years ago at the dodgers cast off kind of lost his place and now he's got a 157 era or some around there johnny quito uh, late in his life kevin gaussman uh, kevin gaussman was nobody was getting man. lit up in baltimore now yeah. he's a fucking ace anthony discafani was this hot shot prospect at the reds then he kind of just fell off gets picked up yeah it's they're really doing what they have been doing with Moneyball, and and they're doing it for the next generation right now is what they're and now they have and also they have money so they're going to be willing to spend. Mm. Um, you know, we even if you on Twitter and you see some Giants fans there, Farhad Tahiti, man, freaking kudos. That guy's built a team right now. Um, I think One he's of got Billy like Bean's the proteges. Yeah, uh, I think he's got like the perfect manager for him with Gabe Kapler, who um, it didn't work out for him with from Philly because Philly seemed like a pretty traditionally ran organization and they didn't yeah. want to do some of the weird things that he was doing and that's how he got fired. But mm-hmm. guess what? San Francisco is willing to take those risks. And they're, so I, I don't know. I don't think they're going to win this division. I don't even know if they're going to yeah. get in a wild card spot because it's like, cool. Even if you can't pass the Padres, the Dodgers, you still have to deal with, you know, the Mets are playing better. The Braves are not going to continue to be under 500. Yeah. Um, the Brewers and Cardinals are going at each other's throats. Philly's playing good baseball as well. The yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Chicago's I think it put them past. Slump. I, I. It's a long season it, ahead, and we're only f- almost sixty games in. Like, what well, if you say twenty twenty? You're, you're you're the betting man here. Would you bet them at least a wild card game? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't place that bet. I wouldn't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. And well, we'll see. I would have to look. I would have to look more at like what their schedule was this past year or this past so far this season, and then compare them with like schedules of like the Cubs and and you know and other teams that are in in the running to really like make an educated decision. But like off the top of my head, no. If you had to put a gun in my hand, say like, are you going to bet this right now? That will actually depends on what the odds are. That's that's the real answer. if the odds are good if it's like if it's like plus 700 then like yeah i'm gonna throw a couple bucks on that why wouldn't i but if they're not that good then no i wouldn't i wouldn't take that actually uh keep going about this for a second i'm gonna look these laws up for you all right so i think the most intriguing thing about the giants is evan longoria 
I think he had a decent season the first season he was there, but he pretty much hasn't done much since then. And they're kind of stuck with him. Um, if I remember correctly, they have like three more years on his contract because he signed that massive deal with the Rays. So if they do play well this year and they could do to go to the wild card, what are they going to do with him? Are they going to dump him at the end of the year and get a, like a real third baseman to compete? Or are they going to keep him like uh, that? That is a very fascinating situation. Um, that's kind of brewing there. Also their number one prospect, Joey Bart is going to be ready. He probably is ready now. I thought it was really weird that they didn't bring him up last year. Um, and are they going to bring him up to play catcher and his buster going to move to first? Like all these things are looming that, that and then where do, where do you move belt? Do you bring belt back? Do you want I think to think he's going to be a free back? agent now? Yeah. So it's like, it's like, do you just let him walk? You know, there's just a lot of interesting questions that if they do play well, could be some tough decisions in the off season, but if they don't play well, it should be pretty cut and dry. Uh, for the record, too, uh, Giants to win the division plus fourteen hundred. Plus fourteen hundred. Wow, those are oh for the division, not to make the playoffs. Yeah, no, no. Uh, my and my MGM does not have playoff a odds. Yeah, to win the division, no, I'm not taking that. No, plus fourteen hundred still still doesn't it doesn't wet my beak enough um all right let's move on to a's news um another uh victim to the to the injured list unfortunately mitch mitch moreland he's heading the dl he had a minor rib injury it's not quite like a cracked or broken rib um i there's a very scientific word for it i could not um i i didn't even think it was worth saying it on this podcast uh, when I looked it up, but let's just say he's got a fucked up rib and he should be back in 10 days. <laughs> it's simple as that. So they brought up my boy, Luis Berea. Um, I think we saw him today. Didn't we? I turned off. He the played game. yesterday as well. Yesterday. How, how did he do yeah, that? I didn't pay attention. I, uh, I don't think he did much, but yeah, he's, he was he's, out there. He's more or less just like a fill in a roster spot. Um, you know, one of the outfield guys are probably going to take that hole. I think, um, I think, Jed Lowry was the DH yesterday. Get him some rest, and Tony Tony Kemp played played second. So it's probably going to be more or less some like a rotation of like Piscotti, Lowry, and uh, and Pinder um, just to get those at bats. So I wouldn't really look too uh, much into the Luis Berea. Um, yeah, call up. he he went zero for one. Zero for one. Yeah, a strikeout. Yeah, it's just it's uh, just to fill a roster spot in case they need him. Supposedly. Yeah, and, and I think it, and it, it's just hopefully I'm hoping you know not going if you're with me. All these injuries are just getting out of the way right now because yeah. if you look at since the start of the season, we've had Lazardo, Fires, Wendelkin, Pinder, Moreland, Garcia, um, Bert Smith. At, you know, and obviously Rosenthal. We haven't seen him pitch yet. Yeah. They've been hit pretty hard thankfully uh again knock on wood Chappie hasn't had any injuries that put him on the aisle matt olson's been having some funky stuff happen with him same thing there same thing with murph but thankfully yeah. the Lowry's core guys are good yeah. ramon yeah um you know piscotti everybody's getting hurt uh, i think they need a some good juju or i need yeah. to at least pay up for their health staff or something like that yeah um, so the Howard terminal proposal has been moved to, um, the hearing for the city council moved to July 20th. Um, we will get more to you when we know they're really, ha- we talked in depth about this last episode. There's not really much more to report here, except for that. I, you know, I mean, I don't know if you want to say anything, Julio, but I just don't, I, I, it's just, I feel like we're beating a dead drum until we get some more information. Yeah. And there was a story, well, not really a story, but a tweet. I forgot who was the source of it. But they're saying that um, some of the city council meetings they've had lately, the latest last few days, mm-hmm. have been optimistic. Um, it sounds like they're kind of willing to do some stuff with them. We, obviously, we, we're not going to know anything. Yeah. But it it seems like their voice, the voices of people are getting heard. So for those of you who are going out there and making your voice heard, if you're this member, if you live in Oakland um, and you have you were able to use your voice to kind of said voice a lot. Anyways, keep doing what you're doing. Just even, you know, to transition to our next topic with them. Speaking of drum, the Oakland drummers 
You may know them as the Oakland 68s. Uh, if you notice on Tuesday night's game, it was very, very quiet. And why was that? They protested the game. Mm-hmm. How they pro and they put out a statement could- and everything on Twitter, and it was retweeted by all the beat writers to make it known the reason why they were not drumming that night. Um, pretty well known organization. They've been with around the team for years and years and years, and there's a lot of them. I didn't even know that there, there's like fucking like a hundred of them. I didn't even realize there was that. Yeah. Many. Um, uh, and, yeah. And uh, um, we're not going to read the full excerpt of what they wrote. It's pretty long. Yeah. Um, but I'll just give you the main quote from uh, Jorge Leon. He is the president of the 68s. When last week's news came out about the A's and investing, investigating options as a, outside of Oakland, we were all devastated. As fans, we are angry, heartbroken, and confused. As residents and taxpayers of Oakland and cities in the greater East Bay, we are deeply concerned about what this would mean for the future of our region. I grew up going to A's game. Now I'm bringing my own two small children to the bleachers. I can't imagine them growing up without a team. Um, you know, we And then from Anson Castanares, I'm assuming he's another member, we express a love for the team and players with our drums, chants, and banners. So it seems right to us to express our feelings this way at a game. It's not a sign that we don't want our players back. It means that this team and our players matter deeply the most, you know, silent protests, which is, you know, kudos. From what I read from all the members they interviewed and like statements, it was, it's mostly a statement towards the team than it is the city. Um, just saying like, yo, bro, what the fuck? Like, why are you doing this? <laughs> to put it in. Well, dude, like, Hey, you're going to move dude lingo. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's like, well, you're going to move. Well, Get used to this kind of environment. Yeah, yeah. This is what your world can look like without Oakland. Yeah. Um, I think that's it, bro. I think that's it for and then we'll we'll go to break. Yeah. Or do you have anything more to touch on? Oh, I did want to say, um shit. I forgot. Fuck. Classic Chris. No, we're talking about Howard Terminal. It's gonna come into my mind in five seconds. Talk about Howard Terminal. You're talking about um oh. So KMBR has been very vocal on their Twitter lately about like talking about the stadium situation and they've been bringing on people to talk about it. And it's been getting a lot of airtime and I'm here to say, I'm not here for that. Fuck that KMBR. You can go fuck yourself. I'm not like, like for real, that shit fucking pisses me off. Like they want to talk about the A's now when this shit's happening. Like they only want to talk about that, about the stadium move and about like that situation. Look, we all know the Giants own part of your your station, so we all know there's a little bit of a propaganda here. And I'm not here for it. Like, I'm just, I just that pissed me off, and I want to say something. And I think a lot of A's fans will get behind me in that statement that I just said. Anyway, no man, for sure. Like, I, I feel, it. dude. I'll be honest. I barely listened to KBR growing up a lot because, like, I didn't have strong radio reception in any <laughs> They actually have pretty strong radio percep- uh, maybe as a kid not as much but now like you can you can get it like yeah you can everywhere. audio stream my, it whatever my, but my I mean I used to listen to KMBR every once in a while when they were talking about the fucking Warriors but they don't even talk about the Warriors that much like it's like Giants off season they talk about the Giants it, anyway I'm just I'm not here for it man that shit pisses me off and I'm like just fuck off like that 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 station can go fuck off cool anyway and that's uh chris's rant of the week well dude they're having they're having alex on tonight they already had her on she was supposed to yeah. be on at eight o'clock to talk about the stadium situation a week later like the the new cycle is over like it, it's kind of like it's kind of quieted down on the western front when it comes to when it comes to the stadium situation and they're still fucking chucking grenades trying to like see what they can get like no man like fuck that i'm i'm i'm, I'm not i'm not doing that so thank you very much for listening to the first part of this podcast. We'll be right back. We're going to talk about some interesting stats with the A's season so far, specifically um, their run differential because it doesn't make any sense with the record. So stick around and we'll be right back. All right. Welcome back. Sorry, everybody, for the rant. I saw that right before we went on air. You no need to apologize. And I wanted to talk about it. But at the same time, if you listen to this podcast, you know that I'm here. This is this is part of what I do. I either This is a about, part of Chris's therapy. I either bitch and talk shit about the Giants or I bitch and talk shit about boomers. It's just like what I it's like Chris 
Town Tailgate 101. So for the new listeners, uh, if you hate those two things, you're going to like our podcast. All right. <laughs> Julio just gave two thumbs up for the audio listeners. Um, so, yeah. All right. We're going to move on to a segment called What's the run differential between me and you? Because you, it's dramatically different. Did I butcher that? Butcher that? You got to do the, you got to do like the song, you know, the what's the run differential? What's the run differential between me and you? You did that even, I'm not even going to try. What's the run differential between that. me and you? Boom. Um, For those of you that don't know, that's a reference to what's the difference between by Dr. Dre. Anyway. Exactly. Um, so, A's fans, um, we are, we were in first place. We're not anymore after that shit show of a series that we just put ourselves into. Um, but we're going to get into that in a second. It's part of this. Um, our run differential for the season is minus 18. Uh, before today, it was like minus 27 or something like that. It, it, it was, I think, I think it was worse, which that doesn't make sense because we lost by a shit ton of runs today. I could have sworn it was worse, Julio. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm tripping. Um, it's historically bad though for a team that's in first place. And we are in like first place in like all of major league baseball a week ago. And our run differential was in the minus. Um, we have a lot of theories behind this. Um, Julio has, I'll let you give your theory first, because I think that makes a lot of sense, especially like going through the schedule and looking at the score. It's like, yeah, I think that's it anyway. So you can, you so can take it away first. We are the only us and the Mets are the only two teams that are above 500 that have a negative run differential. So what gives here's my theory. When the A's win, it's a short margin. It's a small margin. But when they lose, they fucking lose. Yeah. Uh, here's a case point. Over the last 10 games, or the last 10 A's wins. Stat attack. Boop, 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 boop. Stat attack. Stat attack. Do the, the JTA, though. Um, over the last 10 A's wins, their run differential has been plus 21. Right? Good. Over the last 10 A's losses, it's been negative uh, 38. Oh, my God. That's such a massive difference. Oh, man. There are now, a lot of people who... Plus 21, I was like, oh, damn, that's what's up. Yeah, like, yeah, it's good. It's like, oh, that's bad. Yeah, because when they win a lot, it's, it's okay. So if you want to do by the numbers of it all, right? Um, uh, 21 runs divided by 10 games. You're looking at like... They're winning by an average of two runs. Yeah. Whereas when they're losing, they're losing by 3.8 runs. Right. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot, another thing that's been going on, if I'm, I'm on baseball Reddit all the time and they do like a lot of fan, like graphs are saying, like, hey, this is where if your team is here, that means you have poor pitching. We have good offense or good offense, good pitching, bad offense. And they're saying that the A's are a bad team because their strength of schedule has been pretty whack, which um, you can agree with in some sense. Their their win percentage as of tonight of the teams they've played against combined is 395. Now, keep in mind, here's the, the bad teams they've played. Detroit, who um, up to that point, you know, Detroit's actually been pretty hot the last 10 games. But um, when we played in that series, they've actually had pretty decent offense. Baltimore, same thing, even though they're bad. And then the Twins, who just don't list, don't look at the Twins record. They're a good team. Just, you know, they're in a funk. But then you have to look about the teams we have played that are good. Tampa, uh, Houston, three times. Um, Toronto, Boston, Dodgers. Um, I, think that, I think that's actually everybody. And then we play the D-backs. So. Oh, the D-backs, yeah, yeah. When they've played the good teams, they've played the really fucking good teams. Not yeah. just like, hey, middle of the pack, you know, here, here comes the Cleveland Indians or someone like that. No, they're playing really, really, really good teams. And, well, hold on. What, what was the comment they said on Reddit about the run, about um, the strength of schedule, that our schedule is easy? That they're saying we are underperforming as a team. That, uh, it's, it's you based know, on our schedule. Big. Based on the strength of schedule winning percentage, they are underperforming at this team. But I think that's that's hard to say because, like, if, it's like I said, Detroit has looked 
good in flashes. They're obviously not a good team, but you can see why they're playing upset. And even, you know, Baltimore, the same thing. Um, but we So we swept Detroit. We ran into Baltimore's ace twice, but we... We'll see what is... Uh, let me pull that up. And, but we beat them three games to one, and then... Then we split a series. I mean, I, I, I mean, oh no, we lost. We lost two of them the second time. I don't know. I mean, who was this? Look, that, 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 that no, it was. Look, I'm face. paraphrasing this. I, I couldn't tell you the exact numbers behind it, but they're just saying like they're underperforming, which is you know, it, it, it's hard to tell. Like obviously we're for numbers people. You believe in the analytics, yeah. But when you're looking at this Baltimore teams, every once you're like, okay, I know they're not a good team, but they still have those flashes of being a really great team. Whereas if they were to be losing like this to Texas, I'd be like, yo, this is dog shit. What is going on? This yeah. is really bad. But they haven't been. Um, another big reason why this run differential, is, <laughs> run differential is so bad, and we've kind of been talked about this. I'm not sure if on the pod or offline. Um, during that 0-6 start, the A's were outscored 13-50. to 50. Yeah, yeah. That's. I mean, I think that's definitely inflating the numbers a little bit, that 0-6 start. that And I, I, that's definitely overlooked a little bit. But that the first fucking six games of the season, we're playing the Astros and the Dodgers and the Astros again. Like, I mean, I just, yeah, yeah. I, I, that, it, it's, it's a little bit of an overreaction from on Reddit, but because uh, my argument was going to be that our schedule has pretty, been pretty tough, which is the reason why our run different differential has been so fucking bad. But yeah, when we lose, we get our asses kicked. That's, that's it. That's pretty much. And it. the thing, and they, and when they win, it's not by a lot. Yeah. And, because they've played some really tough teams. Like, yeah, I don't think any of those Tampa games were won by more than one or two runs. Those were all really tight games. One run, three runs, and then lost by one run. Um, yeah, they, they've been really tight, tight games, and that's why that it's kind of deflates that number. Is when so except for one game, we won. We beat Tampa by one run in all of our wins against them. Yeah, yeah, like that's because the first series is the same thing. Which also, if you want to feel get a little pet boost, if you're feeling you know pessimistic about the A's, the fact that they've won so many of these one run games should give you some faith yeah. that you know the pen is doing their job and you know the defense is doing their job because that's kind of like where they make their money or whatever money they do make <laughs> for being an Oakland A. But here's the thing, A's fans, there's some help coming all along the way because. The reality of the situation is, what 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 are you? Oh, I was doing like finger guns. Oh, oh, nice. Oh, yeah, oh, there, oh, there's some help oh. coming. Oh, do you want to say something first? Well, no, I think we're on the same page. Let's want to see what you're going to say. Well, there's some help on the way. So our division, other than us and Houston's fucking dog shit. So, and we have only played one team in our division this entire season. And where do those top teams typically like run up their record and shit like that? on the shitty teams in their division because you play them 19 to 22 times a season. So upcoming, we have the Angels um, this weekend series, which me and Julio are going to that game on Saturday. The Mariners. Then we play the Angels again, and then we play the Mariners again, and then we play the Colorado Rockies, who aren't good this year, and then we play the Arizona Diamondbacks, who, you know, they're fine. Um, They're okay. And then we play the Kansas City Royals, who they've shown sparks, but they are below 500. And then we play the Angels again. So there's some relief coming in the next two and a half weeks. Um, so if we come back to this in two and a half weeks and our run differential is plus nine or plus 10, I would not be surprised. And I also Mission would be surprised if we are in back in first place in the American League because I don't have Houston's. I do have Houston's schedule up here. Just kidding. Um, I forgot that I looked at I opened that tab before I, I came on. They have played the Rangers uh, one. Um, they played the Rangers once. They've played the Mariners twice. They've played the Angels twice. They have run through these lower echelon teams in our division, and we haven't even touched them yet. So I'm telling you right now, this is not going to be the story in a couple weeks. Um, it is something that we need to touch on because I think Ace fans are probably hearing it from all ends, uh, you know, at least ones that are on, on social media and stuff like that. But I, I'm telling you right now, Julio, this is not going to be a thing. 
I just want to, we're, we're pretty much at the same point. Yeah. But I want to hammer it down even more. The A's, out of all those teams Chris just named, the A's don't play another team over as, as of right now. You know, Thursday, May 20th, the A's don't play another team that is over 500 until June 18th, and that's the Yankees. Yeah, and then we play the Giants a week after that, but we get a nice little break of the Rangers in between that. Yeah, a four-game series against the Rangers, Giants, um, a Rangers three-game series, and yeah. then a three-game to close out the season. All right, no. All-star break. All star. Right. Basically, the teams over 500 that we play before the All-Star break, Julio, are the Yankees, the Giants, the Red Sox, and the Astros again. But that's very that's like the week and a half before the All-Star break. Um, but these next two and a half weeks, we're playing more or less based on their record, not good baseball teams. So if we there's a reality that we likely will live in where we will run up the run differential and the record in these next two and a half weeks. And as guys, you know, get healthy and are back, you know, pinder. That too, you know, dude. That that's part of it. Yeah. So, like, if anything, um, you know, let's take this victory lap. The A's have been this good throughout this first month and half of the season, despite the injuries and despite a really tough schedule. Even though the winning percentage doesn't say that. Yeah. So you know, kudos. Gonna. My inv- I don't know what that was, but you're gonna do that. Okay. You're doing the the um the like the thing that 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 A's fan that that oh yeah that, that guy was tight doing, that he does every time that Sergio Ro- uh, Ro- Romo comes out and he like swings it around during his walk up song. It's great. I love that guy, dude. Hey, if you're that guy part- and you're listening to this podcast, DM us because we want to bring you on the pod and find out why you decided to bring that to games. Um, my favorite part of the A's broadcast now is when they're playing at home and Romo comes out because they play a song and the whole the Coliseum just goes nuts Mm -hmm. and it's just like and guess what you're not going to get that in Portland or Vegas you are not Mm -hmm. you are not John Fisher you cheap fuck anyway you'll probably get some really good food in Portland and you can probably gamble in Vegas but great food in Portland great coffee in Portland great beer in Portland I highly recommend just going to Portland in general but I don't recommend putting a baseball team in Portland because it's not our baseball team not our team yeah Yeah, not yeah do you want you want to move Tampa go for it cool yeah yeah yeah, yeah. you want to give the Rangers another new stadium hell yeah go for it boom um, all right. I think that'll wrap up um, run differential. I think we explained it all. There's not really much more. We can yeah. Do. So, so let's move on. Long story short, really tough first first month and a half. Quit schedule. freaking out, guys. Everybody yeah. calm down. Let's not lose our composure. That's from uh, old school. We got to keep our composure. Anyway, uh, upcoming schedule. We just talked about it, but we'll. Just we'll say it again. <laughs> the Angels, uh, we head to uh, Anaheim and we play the Angels uh, this Friday through Sunday. Julio and I will be there on Saturday. Look out for us in uh, the stands. Yes, we are in the in the nosebleeds. Um, no trout this weekend, so that'll be a little nice. We get to see Oshan- Otani. He's not going to be pitching, but we get to see Otani. I was going to say, and we don't have to face Otani, so... Oh, do you want to bring up what John, what John, yes. John, John tweet uh, texted you about about the seat? This uh, John, I'm sorry, man, you're fucking delusional. So okay, first off, yeah. So our good friend John Fish, who is the host of the so call it the Super Halo Bros on the Around the Diamond, yeah, fellow baseball network, the Diamond Net Podcast Network. Make sure to give those folks all a follow, please, at Super Halo Bros on Instagram and Twitter, and Around the Diamond on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, John gave us a breakdown um, of the series, and uh, this is word for word. <clears throat> Trout is out, but the offense is still there and actually fairly complete through the lineup compared to 2017 when Trout was out. A much more confident team that has Otani, Walsh, Rendon, Upton, Taylor Ward has been a nice surprise, and Iglesias has been super consistent, which he's not wrong. Um, Julio's favorite angel David Fletcher has not been pesky guy. He usually is, but he moved to the ninth spot after an injury. and seems to game to himself and getting those hits. Yeah, he's been pretty terrible to start the season. Um, you'll probably face Bundy, Quintana, and Henny. Heaney. They'll do really well. They'll do really ugly. It's Dr. Jack over his side. Uh, bullpen has been fine, but uh, Rasiel Iglesias has been much better in safe situations. 
I expect either team to take two, three, obviously like to be the angels, but their start, their starting pitching will either be super solid or give it away in three innings. Um, you're, you're, John, bro, you're fucking delusional, dude. If you think that, the, I mean, good God. I mean, like, does he even know what the record of the angels is? Like, I, I'm just so confused on this. Also, you're, you're going against James Caprillion, Chris Bassett, and Sean Manaya, our three hottest pitchers right now. So good luck, bro. Without Mike Trout, good luck. So we'll see. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to look like an asshole next week on this podcast. But I just, I don't, I, James Caprillion with his first start in his home of SoCal. So pretty stoked about that. Chris Bassett's been killer lately. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean Manaya. Manaya, his last start was rough, but, but, yeah. Oh, Manaya or Manaya, his last start was rough. Oh, the Houston game or is are we t- or the Boston one? The Boston one. The one yeah. where they lost eight to one. He had a rough first yeah. inning. Oh, wait, God, that was his last start? That was like no, eight days just ago. Just kidding. Just kidding. Stop. That was not it. Maybe it was Saturday. Hold on. I remember his last start being rough. It it I'm I it's gonna take too long to go through this. His last start was rough. I know that for a fact. Um uh but it you know it, it, it was it yesterday now i'm stalling to try and find it. you know what's the easy way to kind of figure out uh how somebody's specific stat line is i just go on the yahoo the fantasy baseball app that's a, actually a very good idea uh, uh he went he went six innings he gave up 10 hits but only three runs uh, so oh yeah that's where he got out of trouble but yeah, still yeah. 10 hits anyway it doesn't matter so it wasn't as bad as i thought anyway are, he's still one of our he's still i would say one of our hottest pitchers right now. I I'm just t- excited I to go see the A's Frankie again. before yesterday, but that, that wasn't the thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's first time I've seen the A's play in almost two years, man. Yeah, it's going to be fun. We are going to good times. Good times. Nice little crew. Um, all right, Julio, who is your player of the week? My player of the week, uh, somebody we've been given a hard time to, and he obviously wasn't the best player of the week. There's somebody who's a little more obvious with that, but I just want to give him a shout out. Elvis Andrews. Um, he, didn't, he in this last week he hit 294. He had two walks, one run, hit five singles. He only struck out twice. Um, he's still batting below 200, but I think you're seeing some progress there. He has a he had a little hit streak going on right now. I can't remember if it's still going on at this moment or it ended. Uh, but it's nice to kind of see him getting some of that plate discipline back and his enthusiasm and his joy is kind of really keeps his team loose and, and flowy Better and in hopefully. Leadership. Yep, exactly. And hopefully he can continue hitting like this because if he does, it's a huge shift maker at the bottom of the lineup. So Elvis Andrews, you're my dude. He is hitting 350 in his last seven games, has seven hits, two runs, um, and only struck out three times. So he's made a, a massive turnaround. So I like that a lot. Um, I Wait, was you said having three. You said three fifty. Last seven games, yeah. Oh wow, yeah. OPP is almost four. He's like three ninety four or something like that. Um, yeah. I was having trouble finding one because I was just disappointed in everybody. But then I remembered a fun little tweet that I had a couple days ago. Sergio Romo. <laughs> oh my fucking guy. He's back, boy. He is fucking back. His last seven games, he has an ERA of one point four. He has seven strikeouts. He has pitched six innings. He's only given up four hits, only earned one run. My guy, he's back. He is back, and he's looking good. That slider is looking just, poof. it's just, it's great. And we need him. Uh, we need him. We need him in on down the stretch. So, Sergio Romo, you were my play of the week. Good job. Thought you were gonna say. I thought you were gonna say Ramon. No, I looked at Ramon's splits. They're not very good. He's he still hit. He he points. had that big game against Houston, but he that did. Was it. He had that it, that one game, but but Sergio's had a collection of good games, and and especially um, the win that they pulled out um, a couple days ago against the on Tuesday night. Yeah, the yeah, two yeah, home yeah. runs he, and the walk off. He, he was a massive part of of staying in that game, so that was important. All right, it's like I tweet I tweeted from the account. Also, if I'm following us. Make sure you follow us. Uh, I said, I wish I hated, I wish I loved something as much as Ramon hates the Astros. Yeah. Yeah. He does. He does hate them. All right. Julio, your essential tailgate tool of the week last week was Mitch Moreland and he is on the DL. So that sucks. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's just shit luck. There's nothing you can really do about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hey. Mine was uh, out of the pack, Mark. Uh, Mark Canna. Uh, three homers, baby. Three big ones. Including um, today. Including today. Uh, he's looking so much better. And he let off today, which was cool. So he's getting Bob's trust back. So he's moving him up. But um, yeah, Mark did good. Who's your ETT this week? I'm going to do go with my guy, Matt Chapman, this week. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's been hitting much better over the last couple of weeks or so. It looks like he's starting to get some confidence back at the plate. And for some reason, uh, he loves hitting in Anaheim. Um, but, and here's, here's, here's my bold prediction. From SoCal? Maybe that's a part of it. Yeah, he's from SoCal. He's from, oh, uh, man. Lake Forest. Lake Forest, which is like Orange County, Anaheim West suburb. Lake Village? No, Lake Forest is, it's an Orange County suburb. It's by like Tustin. It's between Anaheim and Irvine. There's a bunch of random little cities, like Orange, Santa Ana, Tustin, Lake Forest, you know, Orange, former Orange County resident for three years. So I can tell you all about them. But anyways, um, the last A's game I went to in Anaheim was June of 2019. And I specifically remember that game because one, we went to Disneyland afterwards. That was tight. Shout out to Genia. And two, that was the day that it was announced uh, Matt Chapman became an all-star. So we were like freaking, I'm like, oh, shit, he's going to be an all-star. Next at bat, home run. So yeah. my bold prediction is our game on Saturday, he's hitting a home run. That'd be badass. I would love to see that. Hell yeah. I like it. Um, Mine is going to be Jed Lowry. Jed, dude, what is the deal lately? I, I mean... You were the anchor. You're Mr. Consistency. Like, this is what you're known for. The last seven games, you're hitting 143. You only have three hits, four strikeouts. It's bad, bro. I mean, he's got he's to gotta figure it out. Because, again, like, he is so important at that two or three hole, whichever Bob decides to put him there, depending on how the rest of the hitters around him are hitting, depending on how Ramon's hitting and how Canis hitting. And it's so important that you get it going because, like, it feels like the offense really sparks around you at least at that part of the batting order, like those guys near you at one, or if you're hitting second at one or the guy hitting third, they just like feed off of your energy. So we need you to step it up. So I hope and expect a big week from, from Jed. That's my, and these, these are the teams you're going against that, you know, this is where people break out of those slumps. Yeah. You know, Seattle's, but Seattle's been no hit twice. Their rotation yeah. is not good. Uh, Anaheim, same thing. I think they're getting lucked out. They're not going to be seeing Otani. Uh, maybe this, maybe Otani's pitching Sunday. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, still, these are very favorable matchups. These are the right teams to really start picking up that offense again. Yeah, Sunday and Saturdays pitchers haven't been announced for the Angels yet. So because Otani pitched possible, but he yeah he pitched this week right? yesterday. I think yesterday. Yeah, so likely we won't see him, but you know, we'll see. Um, I think that's gonna do it, Julio. Yeah. Uh, before we go, make sure to please follow us on Twitter, like and subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to Apple, Spotify, leave us Google Play, YouTube, leave us a review. Make sure to give a follow to our homies around the diamond on Instagram and Twitter, and Chris. Your show's back, man. Kind of, I think. And me at breakfast? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah bro. Me, uh, me and Xavier did an episode last week. Talked about the playing matchup, which is outdated now. Um, but we will be doing another episode next week to preview the – or we'll talk about the first weekend in the first round of the playoffs and then preview – the fir- first round further more anyway we're gonna talk about basketball and xavier's a big WNBA fan now so he wants to talk about the WA, NBA all the time so if you want to get into the WNBA, we did a full like 20 minute segment on it in the last episode so you can fast forward and listen to that which is really good literally xavier did a shit ton of research which we all know xavier doesn't do that he's a class act bullshitter and he <laughs> 
he not class act that's not work world class bullshitter um but he gave some great breakdowns and you know he gave some um really um deep analysis of each team in WNBA there's only 12 teams so it's not that long um so that in order for you to help you pick your favorite team and I picked mine I'm a Phoenix Mercury guy that's the team I decided to follow so go Diana Taurasi go Skylar Diggins go Brittany Griner boom Phoenix Mercury right, well I'm shocked you didn't go follow uh the pride of Wanna Creek Miss Sabrina Ionescu hit a triple double the other day uh the new york um liberty aren't very good besides her she's been playing really well but uh diana trossi is like the greatest women's basketball player oh yeah time, and i love her and skylar diggins is like super hot so like i want to watch her play basketball so and then Brittany griner is just a beast and i've loved her i didn't know she was still playing yeah, I've loved her since she was at Baylor, so it was a She was easy. sick at Baylor. And also, I wanted to pick a team that's relatively, like, location-wise close to me. And the Sparks, I don't know. I've just, like, I think because Lakers and stuff like that, I'm just anti-Sparks. I love yeah. the, the um, um, Abunike sisters, uh, Shanae Abunike and her sister. I forgot her first name. Uh, but, like, other than that, like, nah, I'm good. And then Xavier picked the Chicago Sky which I wanted to pick them because I love Candace Parker. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I didn't want to pick the same team in Xavier so that we could, like, you know, there could be a little rivalry of us watching the season. But yeah, Do you think I'll, Sabrina's an A's fan? I hope so. I don't know. I mean, she she's a... She's, she's a huge a, Warriors fan. She's a Gen X. She's a Gen Xer or Gen Zer. Oh, yeah. She's a Zoomer. No, she's probably a Giants fan. I guarantee she hopped on the Giants fan. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, oh yeah, you're right. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. You're still the home girl. But yeah, you're yeah, right. Still the home girl. Uh, all right, that's gonna do it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. Uh, go subscribe and all that stuff, like Julio already said. And last but not least, Julio. Let's go, Oakland. See y'all in Anaheim. Ooh, Saturday, it's on. Fuck you, Mike Trout. The town tailgate is an independently produced podcast. It is written and executive produced by this guy, Chris Madrigal, <laughs> and my partner in crime, Julio Reynoso. It is sound mixed and edited by yours truly. Social media management and marketing is run by, once again, my partner, Julio Reynoso. And a special thanks and shout out to my brother, Larry Madrigal, for composing and producing our theme song, as well as graphic designing our album cover and artwork. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. Please tune in next week. Please subscribe. And last but not least, as we always say, let's go Oakland.